Hi, my name is John Giltanan. I'm a curator for the uh, car collection here at the Elliott Museum. Welcome. I'd like to tell you a little bit about Sterling Elliott and his son Harmon and give you a little bit of an idea of who these people were and why this museum exists. The museum is dedicated to Mr. Sterling Elliott. Mr. Elliott was born in Michigan in 1852. As a young man, he was very interested in steam engines and modern technology that was starting to come onto the market, and he wanted to make that his life's work. His father, of course, wanted him to stay home on the farm. They had a falling out when he was 17 years old, and he struck out on his own, making his way first to Chicago, where he was told that if he really wanted to pursue a career in modern manufacturing, that he should go to New England, because at the time, that's where all the finest workmanship was, was being done. This was before the uh, advent of the automobile. Nobody had ever heard of Detroit. So Mr. Elliott relocated to the Boston area and settled in a suburb called Newton, Massachusetts, where he established the Elliott Hickory Bicycle Company. Now, when Mr. Elliott started making bicycles, these high-wheeler bikes were considered the state of the art. If you have ever seen people ride them, you know that they're very difficult to ride. You have to kind of balance it and get it moving, then you put your foot on this little peg, vault yourself up into the seat while you try to coordinate your feet with the pedals, and if you're able to do that without falling over, you must be very careful not to steer it too abruptly because that can cause it to fall over. And if you apply the handbrake and hit a bump in the road, it can throw you over the handlebars and you'll land on your head. So as you can imagine, the appeal of these high-wheeler bikes was limited primarily to very athletic young men. Elliot wanted to increase the ridership, he wanted to get more people involved in bicycling, he believed in the health benefits of bicycling. He wanted to get women involved in cycling, which in the 1880s was a fairly daring idea. But he is the guy that came up with the concept of the drop frame bicycle for ladies. He also invented the chain guard. This is a hickory chain guard. When you look at this bicycle, you can see he's trying to equalize the size of the wheels and make the bike more user-friendly. We think that this is the actual bike that Mr. Elliott presented to the patent office when he applied for a patent on this drop frame design. All Elliott bicycles have hickory spoke wooden wheels on them. That's a distinguishing factor. He felt that the hickory spoke wheels were superior to early wire wheels. I don't think history has proven that to be the case, but if you're an antique bicycle collector, you probably are aware of the Elliott hickory, hickory wheel bicycles. I have a couple of others over here that are sort of interesting. This one is a prototype cycle that never went into production, but uh, it is functional, and rather than using pedals and a chain for propulsion, it uses a treadle drive mechanism. So to ride it, you work your feet back and forth in a linear motion. It's very similar to the treadle drive mechanism on those old Singer sewing machines. My grandmother had one in her house, and you probably had a relative that had one of those. Um, sewing machines. Now when you look at this bike again you can see he's trying to broaden the appeal by offering this nice big wide comfortable seat. This bike dates to about 1888. It's called the Elliott Safety Cycle. It was Mr. Elliott's most successful design. And if you just ignore those wooden wheels for a minute and concentrate on the frame, it's a very modern looking bicycle uh, and for the time comparatively lightweight. Elliott was the president of the League of American Wheelmen, which was the largest bicyclist association in the country. The League had over 100,000 members in the 1890s and they organized and sanctioned bicycle racing events all over the country. 
that was very popular in those days. Uh, and when you look at this bike, you can see that it was probably used in those kinds of uh, competitions. For the purposes of our talk today, though, I want to concentrate on this one. This is the Elliott Quadricycle. He designed this vehicle in 1888, and his purpose was to provide a four-wheeled self-propelled vehicle for people who either could not ride a two-wheeled bike or didn't want to ride a two-wheeled bike. When he was designing the Quadricycle, he was observing the way wagons and carriages of the day steered. Typically, they used a straight front axle like this. The wheels were mounted rigidly to the axle so that they turned in unison. And to steer those vehicles, they put a pivot right in the center of the axle. And the entire axle and wheel assembly turned to make those vehicles steer. But when he observed them actually going around turns, he could see that they just fought themselves around the turns. He knew that the geometry wasn't right. Of course, when you had a horse pulling your vehicle and you were only going one or two miles an hour, it wasn't that significant of a problem, but he knew that technology was advancing and he was determined to solve that issue. He came up with two very important inventions which were incorporated on the quadricycle and patented in 1890. Now, when you take a four-wheeled vehicle around an arc, you're carving two arcs. The inside arc is smaller than the outside arc, and that means that the outside wheels have to be able to turn more revolutions than the inside wheels in order for it to properly navigate a turn. So the first thing that he came up with was this assembly right here called the kingpin. The kingpin allows the front wheels to turn independent of each other. Also, if you notice, I have the wheels turned to the right as far as they'll go. And if you look carefully, you can see that the inside wheel is turned at a sharper angle than the outside wheel. And when you reverse it, the same thing happens. That allows the vehicle to carve a nice smooth arc. He called that the steering knuckle, and it was incorporated in the 1890 patent. This is significant because as early car companies came onto the market in the late 1890s, many of them adopted Mr. Elliott's patented design and paid him royalties on it until his patent ran out in 1907. So I think this is a very important piece of early automobile technology, and we're very fortunate to have an example of it here because, as you can see, it's a very fragile thing, and this one has never been restored. In the late 1890s, there was an oversupply of bicycles. There were too many companies involved in making bicycles. The prices started to fall, and a lot of bicycle companies went out of business, including Mr. Elliott's bicycle company. His next-door neighbors were the Stanley brothers, the Stanley steam car guys. At the time, they had a very successful business making dry plate photography technology. And about the time that Mr. Elliott closed up the bicycle factory, George Eastman of Eastman Kodak approached the Stanley brothers and bought them out. That gave them the seed money that they needed to go into the steam car business. They had been dabbling in steam cars as a sideline and a hobby for several years. But when Eastman bought out their photography plate company, they took over Mr. Elliott's bicycle factory, which was next door, and began making steam cars there. The earliest Stanley steam cars were based on the architecture of this quadricycle, which was designed and patented by Mr. Elliott. So again, a very important piece of early automobile technology, and we're very fortunate to have an example here. In 1900, Mr. Elliott established the Elliott Addressing Machine Company in Cambridge, Massachusetts. He had been the editor of the Bicycling World, which was the newsletter of the League of American Wheelmen. Every time he put out an issue of the Bicycling World, he had to mail that to over 100,000 people. So he developed the technology to make reusable 
address plates to help speed up mass mailings. So when the bicycle factory went under, he simply moved on, established the Elliott Addressing Machine Company, which was quite successful. Mr. Elliott died in 1922, but his son Harmon Elliott took over the addressing machine company. He built it up into a multinational. They had offices all over the world and they sold millions of addressing machines. In the late 1950s, Harmon Elliott decided he wanted to retire. He made arrangements to sell the company to Pitney Bowles. He took a million dollars of the sale proceeds and distributed the money to the employees of the company based on their seniority. And he began to make plans to build a museum in honor of his father. Between the two of them, Harmon and Sterling held over 200 patents and they had a lot of artifacts. Rather than build that museum in the Boston area, Harmon decided he wanted to bring his yacht to Florida and retire down here. So he put all the artifacts on a train and brought them down here, built and opened the original Elliott Museum on this site in 1961. About 10 years ago, the board of directors of the museum came to the conclusion that that building was no longer serving our purposes. They put all the collections in storage, demolished that building, and built this new building on the same site. This building is twice the square footage of the old building uh, and is much more robustly constructed. We've been open here now for about seven and a half years. At about the same time that the new museum was being planned, the museum's board was approached by a gentleman named Elliot Donnelly. Mr. Donnelly's great-grandfather was the founder of the R.R. R. Donnelly Publishing Company in Chicago. Mr. Donnelly was uh, a resident of Palm Beach. He was a great a fan of Model A Fords, and he had a collection of 55 1930 and 31 Model A Fords. After some negotiations, the Donnelly family donated all 55 of the vehicles to this museum, along with a very generous gift to help complete this building. When we received the Donnelly collection, it more than doubled the size of our automobile collection. So while we have a a heavy concentration of 1930 and 31 Model A Ford cars and trucks. We have a lot of other vehicles here too, including a number of very significant brass era cars uh, and cars from the 1930s, 40s, and 50s. 